Welcome back to another episode of Murderous Miners. War Baby here with the final installment in the Wild Wild West series. Just so you know, this show is about scary stuff. So don't say I didn't warn you guys. And remember, don't be scared. Episode 38 Safe Word When Tracy Woodside of Glendale, Arizona, popped out to run an errand and received a frantic phone call from her daughter, she didn't know what to think. 16-year-old Jessica Diane Burlew, known as Jessie, called her mother Tracy about 20 minutes after she left their apartment to run to the store and clean out her vehicle near the apartment dumpsters. Tracy had been running errands most of that Saturday, January 18th, 2014, and hadn't been out long that time when Jesse called saying, He's dead, he's dead, saying her male friend was dead at their apartment. So Tracy got home as quickly as she could, to find 43-year-old Jason Ash dead in her daughter's bed. He had an extension cord wrapped twice around his neck, and he was covered in his own blood. Jesse's mother had only met this man the day before, when her daughter brought him over, saying he was going to fix their computer. Tracy recalled that she could tell Jason had romantic interest in her teenage daughter, Jesse told her mother that Jason was 28. When the 911 operator asked how old the victim was, Tracy responded, He's 28. That's what I'm told, but he, I don't know, yeah, he looks older. According to Jason's mother, Marcia, her son didn't possess what she called street smarts. She likened it to a failure to thrive. Marcia herself had come to Arizona in 2006 to be near her family and two years later asked her ex-husband to help get Jason to her. It seemed like a good opportunity for a fresh start. Bred in Georgia, Marcia described a son who seemed listless, who had difficulty keeping work. She recalled Jason going from retail job to retail job where she felt he was bullied. Jason even ended up jobless and homeless when his bank card was stolen and all the money withdrawn from his account. Marcia said she's certain that had Jason been tested, he would have placed somewhere on the autism spectrum. Although aware her son had smoked meth in the past, Marcia did not classify Jason as an addict. Just like Tracy had only met Jason once, Marcia had only met her son's friend Jesse once as well. She wasn't impressed. Marcia commented in an interview on disapproving of the teenager's appearance, but was more uneasy with her lack of social skills. Marcia expected the teen to make conversation with her, but that never happened. After the pair hung out in Jason's room for a bit, Marcia grew uneasy and threw Jessie out of her house, calling her a skink. She said she just got a bad feeling. Following that incident, Jessie only came over to Jason's when Marcia wasn't home. Jason met Jessie on the internet sometime between October 30th, 2013, when the group home CPS placed her in reported her missing, and January 1st, 2014, when Jason Ash texted her the following, 
Well, this is one fun New Year's Eve I'm having. I do have a girlfriend, right? LOL. Along with, had stuff for us to smoke and everything. But oh well, thanks for ruining my New Year's Eve. And you said you want to be my girlfriend? 16 years old in January 2014, Jesse had spent most of ages 13, 14, and 15 in and out of residential treatment facilities and group homes for out-of-control kids. Tracy recalled being a single mother to a hyperactive toddler with an explosive temper. Their extended family severed ties with the pair, saying Jesse was a bad influence on her cousins. She was vocal early on, but struggled to speak coherently until age five. When her speech did become intelligible, her mother described her conversating with voices only she could hear. Jessie had also begun to hallucinate. She was always certain that someone was trying to kill her. Tracy described Jessie as an emotionally disabled kindergartner in a special education class focused on learning disabilities. She had the tendency to throw tantrums, try to hurt herself, and engage in other disruptive behaviors both at home and at school. Throughout her elementary school years spent in Lake Havasu, Arizona, Jessie spent increasing amounts of time in the school resource room, separated from the company of classmates and the instruction of her teachers. Jessie's mother chronicled her childhood years in interviews with the media, detailing the myriad doctors, psychologists, specialists, and prescriptions for bipolar medications that never seemed to work. Once, in the fifth grade, Jessie had to be restrained by school employees, ending up in a full-on brawl. Tracy moved them closer to the Phoenix metro area, so they would have better access to services. The move to the suburb of Mesa didn't improve Jessie's behavior, and she began to run away every chance she got. Jessie admitted to beginning ritualistic self-harm at the age of 11. She would later explain to police that she cut herself to control her anger and depression and because it felt good. She said she found it addicting. She told them, I get bloodlust a lot, like really bad, and I love it. I keep doing it to see the blood drip. I like the blood and stuff. Jessie stayed enrolled at the school in Mesa from the ages of 10 through 13 and described being locked in a dark padded room and other tales of unsavory disciplinary techniques. There was never evidence to corroborate these claims, but Tracy did see discipline she thought was questionable, leading her to take Jessie out. Young Jessie used every chance to flee that she was afforded, like when she jumped off the school bus at a random stop, or when she convinced a stranger to buy her a bus ticket home to Los Angeles at 12 and was gone for two days. Tracy knew she had a difficult time controlling her daughter, who totaled her car when she was 13 years old. Jessie spent the last seven months of 2010 in residential treatment before being discharged to a foster home in the custody of CPS. Without adequate insurance, Tracy signed over custody of her daughter so she could gain access to necessary treatment. Jessie's cutting and drug use blossomed while she was in foster care, and she ended up committed to a psych ward. Jessica Burlew's mother said she received diagnoses of oppositional defiant disorder, pervasive developmental disorder on the autism spectrum, ADHD, bipolar disorder, and schizoaffective disorder over the course of her childhood and adolescence. Hospital after group home after residential treatment facility while she was 13, 14, and 15 years old. And then, 
16-year-old Jessie met 43-year-old Jason Ash in an internet chat room while she was dodging CPS on the streets. While on the run, Jessie would occasionally stop by Tracy's apartment to eat and sleep and get cleaned up. Friday, January 17, 2014, marked the first time Tracy met her daughter's friend Jason when she brought him over to fix their computer. She could tell that Jason liked Jessie. He ended up staying the entire night. Jessie told police that she smoked meth before dawn and spent the day inside the apartment. The only sight of her was by Tracy's neighbor Carol, who said around 4 p.m., Jessie came in her apartment, woke her up, and borrowed $20. Jason Ash was in and out of the apartment that day, as was Jessie's mom, Tracy. Jessie's call brought her rushing home to discover Jason's mutilated corpse and a nightmarishly bloody crime scene. With scalpel-like precision, Jessie had made cut after cut on his arms, hands, face, neck, and genitals. That night while being interviewed, Jessie said that she hadn't meant for this to happen and that honestly, she needed Jason alive. He was the one she counted on to supply her with heroin. Jessie told police that Jason was her boyfriend and that their sexual relationship was consensual. The first cut she made, according to Jessie's police interview, was simply meant to get a reaction from him to see if he was still alive. Jason wouldn't wake up, and Jessie said she wasn't sure what she should do. All the other cuts, she said, were to get things right in her head. Jessie said she cut to relieve the feelings of anxiety in herself. When her mother arrived back at the apartment, she had to get a phone from their neighbor Steve, while Jessie begged her not to call 911. She took off, but not before giving her mom various versions of what happened. She had already claimed to her mother that Jason hit her, a tale Tracy even relayed to the 911 operator, saying, My daughter called me. They were playing a sex game. I guess they got in a fight. She said they got in a fight and he was hitting her. Hitting your daughter? Yeah, and she killed him. I just ran to the store real quick. Yeah, there's blood. She cut him. They're into mutilation shit. Where was he cut at? His arms. He's cut all over. His face. Did she do this to hurt him, or was this like a sex thing? It's, uh, yeah, I think it's a sex thing. Jesse also claimed that an unknown man in a red jacket broke into their apartment and robbed and killed Jason. Jesse even told police this story. 43-year-old Jason Ash was pronounced dead by 6 p.m. The pair had just texted each other I love you around midnight. Jesse fled the apartment complex getting about a mile away on foot before finding a car with keys in the ignition. She drove for a while, but abandoned the stolen vehicle less than 10 miles away. Around 6.35 p.m., Jesse texted Steve, asking if the police were gone, and asked again 20 minutes later. She hitched a ride back to her mother's apartment complex at 63rd Avenue and Olive around 10 p.m. Once she arrived, Jesse went back to Carol's apartment the neighbor who had given her $20 earlier in the day. Jessie said she was looking for concert tickets her mother Tracy was supposed to have left for her. Carol sent her over to Steve's, whose phone had been used to call police. Once she was inside, the residents alerted the authorities. It's summer in Arizona, also known as prime deodorant season. My favorite thing in the world is to smell great, and Myro is making deodorant better. It was 115 degrees in Phoenix the other day, and my Myro had no problem delivering obsession-worthy, naturally effective deodorant that looks as good as it smells. Myro has five unisex scents, Big Dipper, Pillow Talk, Solar Flare, Chill Wave, and Cabin Number 5.